Hey, my name is Reed Bailey, and this is the fifth and final part of our series on analysis of variance. This one focused on model adequacy. That is, does the data meet the assumptions of analysis of variance? If you've been following along, you know our example we've been using is looking at three different fundraising approaches for an opera, and here's what the data could look like. The question is, are the assumptions met by this data the assumptions of analysis of variance. Well, ultimately, what the assumptions are can be summarized as follows. The residuals must be from a normal independent distribution with a mean of zero and constant variance. Well, it's critical to know is what is a residual in the context of analysis of variance. Down here in the bottom is the model for analysis of variance where we have each individual data point equals a fitted mean value for each of the three levels of fundraising in this case, approach one, approach two, and approach three. We had three different approaches and each one had a mean value that it brought in. And then each data point doesn't equal that mean value. It's different by some amount and that is what's referred to as the residual. This is gonna be true where we have to show you what the I and the J are. The I is how many levels of our independent variable, in this case, three, because we have three different approaches that we were trying to raise money. And how many replicates did we have? Uh, in this case, we had eight. We had eight different people uh, within each level that we tried to raise money from. In total, we had 24 people in the study. So let's relate that back to the data a little bit here. And one of the first things to see is for approach one, which are the first eight rows, everything above this red line, we can see that the fitted value is 1306.25. That's just the average value for the eight data points from approach one. For approach two, it's 1735, 1737.50. That's the average value for the eight data points for approach two. The residual, so the fitted value from this equation is over here in this far right column. The residual is in the third column where we can see the actual data point was 1,000, the fitted was 1306.25. So the residual is minus 306.25. The actual data point is in the second column. So 1,500 is bigger than 1,306 because it has a positive re residual for our second data point, and so on and so forth for how you determine what the residuals are. And your stat package will determine these for you automatically. It's just important you have a general feel for what the residuals are because all of the assumption check checking is focused on residuals. There were three things that we needed our residuals to be. Normally distributed, they have equal variances, and be independent. So for normality, we're gonna evaluate this as we would for a t-test, but we're focusing now on the residuals, not on the raw data itself. And by doing so, we're able to look at all of the residuals together, not split it up by the different approaches or different levels of our independent variable. There are some other ways to do this, but let's focus on Anderson Darling and show you what those results could look like. Here's a normal probability plot on the top. Remember, we want uh, our dots to be close to that line in order for it to be a normally distributed set of residuals. And then we see the histogram on the bottom. And I generally am showing this to say, you know, a lot of people turn to histograms initially to look at normality, but it's really hard to gauge normality looking at a histogram. If you're trying to do it graphically, a normal probability plot's a lot more effective. Now, how close to that line is close enough? Well, we know some folks recommend that you get a fat pencil and lay it over the line and see if all your dots are underneath it. We're gonna recommend that you use a statistical test. What test? Well, not the fat pencil test. In fact, it's the Anderson Darling test to evaluate normality. The null hypothesis in this case is that the residuals are normally distributed. So when we have a high p-value as we do here, 
And what it means is that we fail to reject the null hypothesis. And in fact, the residuals are normally distributed. A very small p-value, we would reject the null hypothesis and we need to conclude that the residuals are not normal enough. For equal variances, uh, in this case, there are a bunch of different tests that you can run. We're going to talk about the modified Levine test, but different stats packages may recommend different tests for you to run to check equal variances. We're also going to show you some uh, plots to use if you find your variances aren't equal for your, again, your residuals. Here's what the modified Levine test results look like. Here, the null hypothesis is that the variances are equal. And the alternative is that the variances are not equal. We have a really high p-value in this case, um, which means we fail to reject the null hypothesis, which means we can conclude the variances are equal enough. That's great news, right? We're meeting the assumptions. Now, if we hadn't met the assumptions, we would want to kind of diagnose what, what's going on. So a couple plots we'd want to make. Um, here's one of them residuals versus the factor level. Remember, we had three different fundraising approaches, one, two, and three. And all we're doing is we're plotting on the y-axis all the residuals for each one of those three fundraising approaches and seeing if we see any patterns. Like, do the variances get bigger and bigger? Uh, is there one uh, maybe approach which it has huge variances and the other ones are all about the same? You're just trying to figure out what's going on if you found out that your variances weren't equal from a statistical test. Now, you also want to really plot the residuals versus their fitted values, because sometimes a pattern might emerge there that you don't see when you order them by just the approach name or approach number. This is actually the same data. It's just being plotted where approach two is up here, plotted around 1750, something like that. Uh, this down here looks like approach three, just under 1200. And then just over 1,300 is approach one. Same Y data, you're just plotting against their fitted values because, like we said, sometimes a pattern might emerge there. Now, here's an example of what a problem could look like for an, uh, equal variances. And you can see, in this case, it looks like the larger the fitted values, the higher the variance. And this is meaning that an assumption for ANOVA is not being met. Independence, we are going to evaluate this based solely on graphical approaches. There are some other ways to do it, uh, but we're going to look at just looking at the graph. You do need to know the order in which your data was collected so that you can plot the residuals in that order. So let's just say we had the observation for our data, observation order for our data uh, for the OPERA. And you can imagine maybe someone who's applying these approaches gets better at them over time. And so there's some kind of trend in our data. But in fact, we don't see that. The data is up and down all over the place. It doesn't look like there's any issues with independence. Uh, here's an example of what independence could look like if, it were, if there were an issue, um, where there's a clear pattern here of some sort. And it probably means there's some variable or independent variable or factor that we're not including in our model that actually is very influential. And and we're seeing the effect of that in these pattern, whatever pattern it is that we see in our residuals plot by order. So to summarize for analysis of variance, all of your assumption checkings on the residuals, they need to be normally distributed, have equal variance and be independent. Uh, for normality, check that with the Anderson-Darling test and you can visually look at it with a normal probability plot. If it's not normal enough, you can always run a non-parametric test a Kruskal Wallace test in the case uh, for ANOVA, the non-parametric equivalent is a Kruskal Wallace. For variances, there are lots of tests where we showed you how to check it with a modified Levine test. And for independence, just plot the residuals versus time and look for patterns. If you find some patterns, it may be because there's a variable that uh, you're not taking into account that's actually quite influential.